All are sleeping. <laughs> Afternoon is a time for sleeping. But we have Dr. Shivani, who will not let you sleep. In fact, she <laughs> keep you absolutely 100% alert uh, with a storytelling style. Dr. Shivani, CEO, Theory of Purpose, is a doctorate consultant and speaker in the field of workplace cultures. She has a passion for issues around leadership and is working on unconventional stimulating work in the area of competitive cultural advantage through workplace spirituality, values, and other deeper purposes in work. She, her uh, thesis was endorsed by the prestigious department Faith at Work at the Princeton University. She helps organizations around the world articulate value-based behaviors. She guides individuals and organizations along as they maneuver the complex myriad of rules and regulations. Dr. Shivani spent the bulk of her 19-year career working in large, complex banking corporations in senior roles. She has published several research papers, chapters in books, and for the past four ye uh, few years, focused on leadership development, cultural transformation, and team dynamics with industry leaders. She's a certified consultant as a practitioner of happiness at work, and a certified facilitator in Barry's value assessment. Now she speaks at various fora like Maharashtra State Police, IPS, Naval War College, in addition to NIPM, NHRDN, et cetera, et cetera. And our list of clients includes everybody, including Citibank, Mahindras, Tata's, Sipla, Don and Broadseat, et cetera, et cetera. So may I present to you Dr. Shivani, who will talk on team and talent, team work and talent in supply chain. Welcome, please. Come. Right, so um, thank you, and I think he's been very generous with his uh, praise. I promise to give you a couple of stories and not give you, uh, you know, too much of a how do you say, download on details on what team and talent are all about. Uh, first thing is, I was really mesmerized by the presentations before me because they're so um, technically rich, and I am somebody who is, uh, as I mentioned to. Um, Amit a little earlier, that I am technologically primitive. So I actually belong to an age where technology and um, data and statistics and blockchain and all are items which we aspire and strive to reach. So I still hover in the arena and in the domain of storytelling because I grew up at a place where technology was absent. I grew up at a time and in a decade tons of kilometers, miles, millions of miles, as they call it, away from this place in a very tiny little city called Wagadugu, which is from a small town or a small country which is not even found on the map for most people, which is called Burkina Faso, which is a small little country in the west of Africa. And over there at that point in time when you had to take a plane for three days to get back to India, the only thing that kept you entertained and educated were stories and books. So most of my life has been with Amar Chitra Katha and stories that were shipped to us when anybody came to visit family and friends traveling from India. Would, the only thing my parents would request relatives to bring was Kitabe Leana. So most of our life has been, my sisters and mine, has been growing up with stories. And what I realize is that these stories have provided insights into everything that we do in life. And um, today's interaction that I hope to have with you is a little bit around storytelling and what team and talent, teamwork and talent looks like, especially in a supply chain industry. But before we start off, I'd like us all to do something. So this is an activity we're going to do in the next two or three minutes. So um, you're going to actually just 
look around you, all right? You're just going to look around you and look around in the room. And what I want you to do is, when I say start, you're going to point your hand out at an object. Any object in the room, you're going to point out at that object. And then you're going to call the object, you're going to call the object's name, but you're going to call it what it is not. So for example, I'm going to point to the chair, and I'm not going to say chair. I'm going to say light bulb. Or I'll point at the ceiling and I'll say uh, plate. Or I'll point to the air conditioner and I'll say flower. Or I'll point to somebody and I'll say television. So you're going to turn around and point out to something in the room and call it what it is not. Clear? All right, but the only thing you're going to do is you're going to do that loudly in a loud voice. You're going to point your fingers at that item. If need be, you can stand up and do that. So that's what we'll do. We'll all stand up and then we'll point out at that item and we'll together continue shouting out the names of those things and calling it what it is not. And you will continue to do so till I tell you to stop. Okay? So can we all stand up? If you want to feel free to walk around and point to things, you can do that. So when I say start, you're going to, and you have two things you have to do. You have to point to that thing, all right, to the item. For example, I'm pointing to the clock on the wall, and I'll say television, all right? Then I'll point to the floor, and I'll call it plate, or I'll point to something else, and I'll call it shirt. But you cannot say the name of the item it is. You have to call it what it is not, and loudly, so I, we can all hear each other's voice, all right? So when I say start, you can start, and you will continue pointing to different things till I say stop, okay? So start. Point out and call out the words loudly. <laughs> you have to call it different words. <laughs> Come on, go on. Can, you have to move past grass. <laughs> you can't repeat the word. Come on. Point to the things. I didn't tell you to stop. Go on. Two more times. Okay. All right. Thank you. Stop. Maybe we can sit down. This was terrible. You all didn't pass. So if you notice what happens when you're forced to call something what it is not, your mind works in a way which makes you want to get back into the habit and into the pattern and into the comfort zone which you've been through all along. So somewhere by default mode, you believe that this is the only way to do something and it's the only way to call that thing. And then you're tuned to seeing it in that fashion. In fact, if you heard somebody else say the word, the next word was his. So somebody said grass and he picked grass. The next word he called out was grass. And then somebody said shirt, and somebody else picked up at the back, heard that word shirt, so the next word was shirt. So you're listening to somebody else, and then you're using that same word for yourself as the next one. And the second thing that I noticed you all did is you followed a pattern. Shirt, pant, belt, shoes, socks, grass, flowers, trees, buildings, aircraft, uh, train, plane. These are the words you were using. Now, this is something which we call force of habit. And there's a phenomenon that I want to share with you before we even step on to our next conversation. It's called stockpiling. So what you did right now was stockpiling. And that's a word which I think your supply chain uses also. All the supply chain maestros know stockpiling. So how the mind works especially is you're so used to following one particular pattern. You're not willing to be creative. You're not willing to be dull. You think you need to find the perfect answer for everything because of which even the opportunity that comes your way, you're not willing to see because it doesn't look familiar and it doesn't look like something that can fit into a typical pattern. So stockpiling is an activity which essentially makes our mind look for typical ways of doing things until we find the ideal fit and the ideal size. Now what I thought we could experience with this activity is that you have to have the courage to be dull. So if you dare to be dull, you will be able to find talent. And the first thing that I think we need to get um, a little clear about is 
you need to have courage or one needs to have courage to believe that things come in different forms and in different sizes and in different formats and can appear from anywhere now to share this with you um i'm going to tell you a story it's um, one of my favorite stories and it's about shivaji maharaj so we've all heard of the great shivaji maharaj and the story is about his um his one of his guards one of his forts and um the fort was very beautifully guarded by um, you know by a lot of uh, his soldiers of course it was one of the strongest forts that he had and um in that fort there used to be a lady called hirkani who would walk up to the fort every morning to sell um sweet meats mithai bechti thi wahan pe every morning so every morning she would get up and she would go into the fort and she would sell sweet meats and mithai to everyone and in the evening at about 5 o'clock she would come to the door or apna she would take her basket and go back home after finish after finishing selling whatever she was sold so one day she went upstairs and um the the queen and the princesses were having an event so they asked for her help in the palace so she got a little late and generally she used to leave the palace the, the fort by about 5 o'clock lekin us din der hui thi so she couldn't leave and she left at about 5:30 sade 5 baje she started walking towards the gate as soon as she reached reached the gates of the fort the soldiers at the gate turned around and told her that um, you know it's too late we've shut the doors now you can't walk out so hirkani was really worried she says what do you mean i can't walk out just open the gate i need to leave and go so the soldier says nahi hukum hai raja ka hukum hai ki you cannot open the gates again ek bar jo aap andar ho to abhi now wait go the next morning you can't leave now she's worried because she has a small child at home He, she's extremely uh, stressed about that that mera chota bachcha ghar pe hai how can i not go home i can't stay here please let me go home tonight they say no you have to stay here yahan pe reh jao kal subah chale jana aap so hirkani now is really stressed about all of this and she can almost hear her child cry for her she says i have to do something so she decides to get up and she says let me look around and she's really restless by that time in the night तो यहाँ वहाँ देख के शी सेज लेट मी फिगर आउट समथिंग एंड इन द मिडल ऑफ द नाइट शी इज एक्चुअली फिगरिंग आउट इफ शी कैन फाइंड अ डोर टू लेट हर आउट शी रीच एस अ साइड ऑफ द फोर्ट एंड शी सी इज अ वॉल शी क्लाइम्स अप द वॉल शी क्लाइम्स अप द टॉप ऑफ द वॉल रीच इज द टॉप ऑफ द फोर्ट वॉल एंड देन स्टार्ट लुकिंग डाउन एंड शी सी इज अ साइड ऑफ द क्लिफ एंड शी सी इज अ स्मॉल लाइट इन द विलेज डाउन देर बिसाइड द क्लिफ एंड शी रियलाइज दैट दैट्स हर हाउस देर इज अ लाइट फ्लिकरिंग देर एंड शी कैन ऑलमोस्ट हियर द वेल्स ऑफ अर चाइल्ड so she gets up and us andhere mein she starts rolling down the hill and she reaches home the next morning when the soldiers are opening the door they see hirkani out there at the door again aap yahan kaise aap to andar the she says ha huh, lekin i i went out how where who's a uh, you know the the person who's actually cheated us over here who's a spy here who let you out she says nobody let me out i climbed the wall and i came out and they said no not possible this is the strongest fort that exists in shivaji maharaj's reign there it's not possible that you could climb out of it she says i did so they said can you please show us where and that's when she takes them to the side of the fort to show where she climbed up the mountain and came down from and the news reaches shivaji maharaj and shivaji maharaj says mujhe dikha dijiye ye kaun hai hirkani kaun hai i want to see because she is the only woman who seems to have scaled a fort which was supposed to be impenetrable according to me So eventually Hirkani comes in front of him and Shivaji Maharaj says I want to reward you can you show me how you came down So she shows him how she came down And Shivaji Maharaj essentially said that this one woman who is supposed to be just a sweet meat seller actually turned around and showed you how your fort could be attacked at a point in time when you thought it was impenetrable and showed you that there were lacunae and loopholes in your system It is only for us to see what she shown us and learn from that lesson now the reason i want to share hirkani story with you is that eventually talent can actually be demonstrated in ways you can't imagine and it is up to us to be able to see all of this from a lens that we want to see it from so if you flash forward into the way we work in the corporate world very often people come to us with ideas about things that we are not comfortable with they come to us with different suggestions of how to do things and we're not familiar about how to react to it but eventually if you realize that the contribution they are making can actually change the way you function or the way you think 
that is talent. So the next couple of minutes is I'm going to share with you are purely based on storytelling, but to tell us that it's our perspective on how we see talent that is going to determine how talent actually operates in our industry. So if we are used to the round square, I mean the round that has to fit in the round, you won't be able to believe that there's some other shape that can be created for some other hole as well. So this was Hirkani's story. And I want to tell you um, a couple more stories, of course, if I can manage to keep some of you awake in the, in, in the room. But it's all about storytelling, as I told you. The other story, which I think is very pertinent for all of us, and it's one of my all-time favorite stories, is about um, King Janak. Have you heard of Raja Janak? So, Mithila ke Raja the, Raja Janak. Or uh, Raja Janak ki ye kahani hai, that again, it talks about how most of us need to start changing our perspective towards talent. So the first few minutes, I want to talk about perspective of talent and how important it is. Pehle to dekha ki talent can come in any form and anybody can demonstrate it. Hirkani was not supposed to climb the mountain, but she did. And Shivaji Maharaj recognized it and honored it. Here, what I want to share is sometimes as bosses or as managers or as leaders, you have to be able to realize that the talent has different, different forms also. So ye jo kahani hai, it's about Raja Janak. So Raja Janak um, was in Mithila and Mithila was attacked one day by an enemy king. There was a king that attacked uh, Mithila. And uh, Raja Janak got up, he wore his armory, he got onto his horse, took his swords, decided to climb you know, onto the horse and lead the journey to go and fight the enemy king which had attacked Mithila. So he went onto the battlefield and he was fighting really hard to save Mithila from the enemy king, the brutal enemy king. Unfortunately, the enemy king was stronger. So enemy king de uh, dethroned Raja Janak from his horse basically, uh, dehorsed him and then put him to the ground and then held his sword against Raja Janak and said, you know, Raja Janak, you have lost the war. Look at the people all around you in the battlefield. So Janak, Mithila ke sub soldiers were all on the floor. Everybody had lost the battle. There was devastation. There was death and, and, and blood and, uh, you know, all his soldiers lying all around him. It was all over. The battlefield was really sad and it was devastation there. So Raja Janak was on his knees, he had fallen down and the king is holding a sword to him saying, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be punished now because I have uh, overpowered you and you need to get out from here. So uh, King Janak is like really upset about this whole thing. I think we have, okay. we have a snoring gentleman in the audience. <laughs> no, King Janak was by then really um, upset at the way things were moving onwards and he said, you know, this is something I really can't deal with. It's devastation at its worst form. Fir the enemy king says, okay, Raja Janak, your punishment is not going to be death. I'm not going to kill you. Your punishment is you have to be ashamed that you have lost the war and you have to get out of Mithila. Aap ye kingdom chhod ke jaye. Your punishment is you will leave Mithila and you have to get out and go someplace else. So Raja Janak by then is really upset and he's really, his shoulders are drooping, he's sad. He makes his way outside the borders of Mithila and comes to the neighboring village, passing by. Or jaise wo ja rahe, he's begging for food and water from all the villagers around him, but nobody wants to help him. Because the enemy king has told them, koi help nahi karega Raja Janak ke. he has to be ashamed and walk out of the kingdom. Reaches a neighboring kingdom, and jaise wo bagal ke gaon mein chale jate hai, wahan pe, he sees ki there's a, there's a mela, and there are some people serving free food and free water. By then Raja Janak is tired and hungry and he's, his bones are paining and he's weary and he feels like he wants to die. He's thirsty, he's hungry. So he goes and stands in line waha pe. Unfortunately, by the time his number comes, jo bavar ji waha pe hote, wo bolte ki, Raj, you know, maaf ki je, kuch bacha nahi hai, sirf dal ka paani hai. To Raja Janak bolte, chale ga, wo de di je. To ek patra mein, unko dal ka paani milta hai. And he takes that and he's saying, finally I get something to drink. So he's taking that in his hand and he's just walking slowly and he goes and wants to just sit beside a tree so that he can drink it. Or jaise wo ped ke niche ja ke bed jate, there is an eagle that swoons down on that and knocks it out of his hand. And at that time, Raja Janak just looks up and says, Hey Bhagwan, mujhe kyu zinda choda hai? I can't bear this anymore. And he's crying and wailing and he's flaying his arms. And then suddenly he hears 
राजा जी राजा जी राजा जी उठिए 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 क्या हुआ सो ही ओपन इज आईज एंड ई सीज हम तो मेल में है ही लुक्स अराउंड हिम एंड ई सीज हिज क्वीन ही सीज ऑल द कोटियाज अराउंड हिम ही सीज ही लुक्स अराउंड ही सीज हिज बेडरूम ही इज लुकिंग डाउन एंड ई सीज ओके वॉट इज गोइंग ऑन एंड देन सडनली ही सीज कि हिज हैंड्स आर स्वेटिंग हिज क्लोथ्स आर क्रम्पल्ड his hair is all mucky his face is looking very dark and sweaty his heart is beating his eyes are dilapidated so he's looking around and saying ye kya hai and then he starts asking the question kya ye sach ya wo sach now nobody understands what raja ji kya pagal jaise sawal kar rahe hai ye sach wo sach matlab kya there is one rishi ashtavakra muni jo guzar rahe hote mithila se aur उन्हें पता चलता है कि राजा जी पागल हो गए कुछ सवाल कर रहे हैं ये सच या वो सच तो अष्टवक्र मुनि कहते हैं मुझे ले चलिए वहाँ पे आई वॉन्ट टू सी हु इज इस राजा आई वॉन्ट टेक मी आई वॉन्ट टू आंसर इस क्वेश्चन तो वो चले आते हैं राजा जी के पास एंड ही लुक्स एट किंग जनक और खुद से कहते हैं राजा जी क्या आप वहाँ थे जब वो सब हो रहा था आपने देखा डिड यू सी एवरी थिंग दैट वॉज हैपनिंग देयर विथ ऑल द सोल्जर्स ऑन द बैटल फील्ड did you see all the devastation and destruction heat and 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 death did you see it to raja janak kehte hain ha maine dekha okay raja ji aap abhi yahan pe aap ye sab dekh rahe ho aap mujhe dekh pa rahe ho can you see your queen can you see the palace can you see all the finery around you to raja ji kehte hain ha ye bhi dikh raha hai to then raja ji kehte hain na ye sach na wo sach aap hi sach so he says that every human being goes through different states sleeping state waking state dreaming state all of us go through three different states but there is a fourth state which is called the state of consciousness that passes through all these three states now i am sharing this with you is that when it comes to talent we have to realize that talent goes through different forms also the form of talent you are looking for is not necessarily in the format you are seeing it in it could be in a format that you are not seeing it in and how do you do that or how do you find that is only when you are able to ask the right questions and challenge people to do things which they don't think they know how to do and that is when you will really find talent so talent is not as easy the way dronacharya went searching for talent so dronacharya ki bhi to kahani hai that he was a guru who was looking for students मतलब जैसे स्कूल चलाते हैं और आपको एडमिशन चाहिए वैसे उनको भी एडमिशन चाहिए थी ही वॉन्टेड स्टूडेंट्स टू कम एंड टेक एडमिशन इन इज गुरुकुल तो ही वॉज पासिंग बाय हस्तिनापुर एंड ही रियलाइज कि वहाँ पे पांडवा खेल रहे हैं दे वर प्लेइंग बिसाइड अ वेल सो ही सेट दिस इज माई चांस टू गो एंड इम्प्रेस दैम सो ही वॉक्स अप टू द वेल वेर ऑल द पांडवाज आर प्लेइंग बिकॉज वहाँ पे द पांडवाज हैव लॉस्ट वन ऑफ देयर बॉल इन साइड द वेल सो द्रोणाचार्य थिंग्स ओके दिस इज माई चांस टू इम्प्रेस दी स्टूडेंट्स सो ही टेक्स ग्रास ब्लेड्स ऑफ ग्रास and he says wait i'll help you pull the ball out or wo ek ek blade of grass he keeps throwing it inside the well the blade of grass attaches itself to that ball inside the well and he makes a long chain and he makes that chain and he pulls that ball out and gives it to the pandavas or pandavas kehte baap re itna talent you know and they take him running of course to the raja and at that point in time bhishma pitama dekh ke kehte are dronacharya you must come here and you become the guru to my students and that's how he became the guru to in another in in our own uh, variety of storytelling that's how he became the guru to the pandavas essentially but that's how he realized that he can actually extract talent in different form so the point here is if you are able to ask the right questions and believe that talent need not necessarily be only in x plus y is equal to z formula and give opportunities to people to see things differently you will see talent emerge differently as well now after all of this what do you do with the talent and how do you get teamwork to come from it especially in the supply chain industry again without having too much of experience in that what i can share with you is is something called popularity now teamwork becomes successful if it is popular simple logic if you are able to make your organization culture one which supports teamwork you make teamwork popular teamwork will thrive if your organization culture is one which is only of individuals then individuals will thrive 
but you can't succeed without teamwork. And the only way of getting teamwork possible is when everybody realizes that they're in it together. If you don't realize that you're in it together and you're a very individualistic thing, it's not going to work. The second most important thing in all of this is about realizing that there is a purpose, common purpose. So the first rule, of course, is popularity, create, making teamwork popular. The second rule is about purpose, that finding a common purpose in things. Let people realize that there is a common purpose that attaches them to a common team goal. That's the only way teamwork will thrive. And for that, I have a very short and, and extremely, according to me, a very sweet story, which is also extremely hilarious if you see it from that perspective. And the story is of the princess of Kashi. So again, you've all heard of Kashi. So Kashi mein Kashi, there was a king and a queen, Raja or Rani Kashi ke. So they had a huge celebration in Kashi at one point in time. Or wo celebration mein, they wanted to call all actors and actresses to have a play. They wanted a big play pe, to make the annual day celebration jaisa hota hai, organizations mein. Now to, there were two or three different roles that people had to play. Or pe, one role that was there in that play was that of a little princess of Kashi. Now who can they find to be princess of Kashi? They did a lot of auditions. Nobody, no child, no sweet girl was fitting that role. So finally what the queen did is she told the actors and actresses, Ki aap Yuvraj ji ko le lije. Dress him up like princess of Kashi. He's anyways four years old. So he's very sweet looking. Usko aap sari wari pehna ke make him princess of Kashi aur wo role kar lega. So then all the actors and actresses saying, chalo, theek hai, Yuvraj ji ko le lete hai. So they took the little prince, they dressed him up and they made him play the role of Princess of Kashi in that play. The play was a huge success, huge success. Queen was very happy, King was very happy and even the prince did the role so beautifully that everybody could not imagine that it's a boy and not a girl. So the queen was very happy and she calls the artist, the local artist and says, inka painting bana do. So somebody comes, the artist and makes a painting of that little boy and writes below the painting, Princess of Kashi. And that painting is framed in, in, in one of the rooms there. Now, 15 years later, 15 years later, the prince, who is Yuvraj, he is walking around in the palace. And as he says, he reaches one room. Sir, am I boring you too much? No, not at all. Okay. He is walking around inside the entire palace. And as he's walking in the rooms of the palace, he comes across and he's looking around and he sees this painting where there is dust. Hai. So he goes near the painting, he dusts the painting little and he looks here, he looks like that. And he's admiring the painting from close by. Then he goes and he wrote there, Princess of Kashi. And there is a date for 15 years ago. So he's looking at that painting and he starts smiling. And then he says, hmm. And then he comes back, okay? And then a few days he's behaving like a mad person, going around here and there with no attention. He doesn't say anything. Raja ji pooch rahe, kya hai? Yuvraj ko kuch bol nahi rahe. Finally, they call the chief minister of Kashi and they say, aap pooch lije, kya hai Yuvraj ji ko? So then he says, aaj So he calls the prince and he says, bed jaye, kya hai aapko? Kya problem kya hai? Why are you behaving like this? You're not paying attention to your duties. Mujhe pyaar hua hai. So then the chief minister is saying, Matlab, ye toh achhi baat hai, kon hai? So he says, Princess of Kashi. So the uh, minister is saying, kaha, kaha, kaha dekha apne? Where did you meet her? So the prince is saying, No, no, I haven't met her, maine dekha hai. Achha, lekin kaha? Photo mein. Photo mein dekha hai? Kaise? He says, Aiyye, mein dekha tiyo, pandra sal pehle ka photo hai. The minister is, eyes are opening up, kya bol raha ye? Le chaliye mujhe maa pe. Come quickly. So then they both go running into the storeroom and the prince is walking there and says, aye, aye, dekhe. and he drags him into the store and he dusts the painting and he says, dekhe, dekhe. isn't she beautiful? This is a photo of 15 years ago. It was probably 3-4 years ago. Now it's 18 years ago. I have to marry So now the minister is looking at him and he's looking at the painting and he's dusting the painting and he's looking at it and <gasps> and then he says, Yuvraj ji, sit So he says, what happened? No, prince. There is no princess. Matlab? Princess saying? He says, Nay, Yuvraji, koi princess nahi hai. 
कोई बात नहीं शी इज एन ऑर्डनरी गर्ल इट्स ओके आई डोंट आई डोंट माइंड लेकिन मुझे इससे ही शादी करनी है सो द मिनिस्टर से नो युवराजी शी इज नॉट अ प्रिंसेस इज आई अंडरस्टैंड आई डोंट वॉन्ट अ प्रिंसेस कोई ऑर्डनरी लड़की है तो भी चलेगी मुझे इससे ही शादी करनी है दैट टाइम शी सेंग दैट टाइम द मिनिस्टर से युवराज जी नहीं ये प्रिंसेस ही नहीं है देर इज नो गर्ल लाइक दिस दैट्स वन ही सेज वॉट यू मीन ही सेज नो द प्रॉब्लम इज दैट दिस इज नॉट अ रियल पर्सन दिस इज यू सो ही सेज वॉट ये तो आप ही हो ये आप ही का तस्वीर है दिस इज योर ओन पेंटिंग एंड देन ही गिवस एम द होल स्टोरी एंड देन ही सेज तत्वम असी which essentially means that that art thou now the reason i'm telling you this is when you are able to find a purpose and make it a common purpose for a lot of people in the organization they will start seeing a reflection of themselves in that so the minute you have a larger purpose and i saw in one of the earlier presentations i think uh, in sir's presentation i saw earlier he used the word trust trust in your suppliers trust in your vendors trust in your relationships and that trust can only come when they believe that there's some part of that which belongs to them in that goal or in that objective so if you have a common purpose you will see a lot of people coming together for common teamwork so that's the second p the first one of course was making it popular the second one was purpose and last but not least the third one is called power you need to create sources of power for teams in the organizations and power can come in different forms and the only story that i will leave you back with is about what happened with um asma mahfuz and egypt when she wanted to bring down hosni mubarak's regime there was one facebook post that asma mahfuz put down in 2011 at that point in time asking people to gather at tahrir square four men came along with her but the egyptian government hosni mubarak was so scared about the kind of uprising that will come there that he sent 15 tankers he sent water um, uh, pipes he sent machine guns and about 150 army men on tahrir square to protect um, and ensure that there was no chaos on tahrir square asma mahfuz was one girl who did that with one facebook post but four men came five days later she posted again and then the whole of egypt literally gathered down on tahrir square and of course the rest is history because he had to step down after 11 days of siege but the point here is power is now available through information so the more you are able to give information the more you are able to empower people the more you will see teamwork come together if they start thinking that for every small thing they have to go to the boss or they don't have power anywhere teams will not function and the more you leave power and more you allow them to use their power respectfully they will thrive so there's a 3p formula as i mentioned one is of course making it popular through your culture it's about ensuring there's a common purpose and last but not least it's about ensuring that power is given to teams so talent can thrive now after saying all of this there's um i'm going to call it a day over here a little earlier so that we can have some questions but before i leave i'm just going to tell you um one last share one last picture with you this picture was taken um in uh, in the 2017 uh, texas floods irma hurricane that happened in texas do you know what this image is yes but what is it what is this image about of no the picture is of red ants this picture is a satellite image it's by the way gone viral on it's a national geographic award winning photograph it's an image of red ants during irma flood red ants have antenna and what these red ants did in one particular colony is that they hooked their antenna into each other and they created a raft like structure so that they could remain afloat for 48 hours in the flood waters so for 48 hours these ants have remained alive in flood waters when nothing else survived only by hooking their antenna into each other now that is the power of purpose that is the power of being able to have a common goal 
and that is the power of culture also because ants work in colonies ants work in cultures they have typical cultures for typical colonies and their single most purpose is that the survival of one depends on the survival of the others and if the others don't survive you can't survive that is their purpose statement in other words it's also called ubuntu that's their purpose statement now this is a live demonstration of what purpose and culture can do and essentially of course i don't know which internet google uh, resource they had to know how to create the raft like structure but they obviously had information that made them do that so if we have these three elements correct we can actually channelize talent and create teamwork like never before so on this note i'm going to take your leave and um if there are any questions happy to deal with that else um thank you so much and have a great afternoon Yeah, so may I request Mr. Lobo to please present a small memento to Shivani. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, Mr. Lobo, the tea time is 3.15 or 15? Okay. All right. <coughs> Time for tea break. <clears throat> I will make some observations on since morning that we have been discussing. See, the first thing when we see lots of uh, you know technology, lot of etc. etc. The talent development should really come to the attention first of all. Talent development is the must. It's very easy to buy machines. You have plenty of money, but you can't buy talent. Talent has to be developed. Okay, some extent of talent, you can have qualifications. So talent, we need to focus. And in supply chain, somehow, we'll find I'm sure half the people of supply chain must be engineers here. You know, so we're all technically oriented. So uh, first technology comes into our mind and so forth. Now you must have heard of a name called Mr. Rusi Modi. Rusi Modi was a very well-known, you know, CEO of Tata Steel for years together. And one of his very famous statements is, modernize your people's minds before you modernize your machines. I mean, we have written that in, the, in our brochure also. So modernize your people's minds. Now, modernizing machines is very easy. You import it. You know, what I import licensing is also gone. Whereas modernizing people's mind, because we have the word called mindset. Now, I said that this is not the era of having mindsets. Positive mindset, negative mindset, no. We need what is called the flu fluidity, fluidity of mind. In the event, the flexibility of the mind to adopt or rather foresee what will happen and then create the change. After all, all the new machines are being created by somebody, human beings only. They're not coming out of their own. So now we are the users of those technologies and user machine. So if we keep ourselves prepared that yes, I must take care of my own talent development and my team's development. That's why we use again in the brochure, you must have seen small TAT and big TAT. Small TNT is tools and techniques. We are experts, you know, if you ask us any tools and techniques, we'll tell you what is supply chain latest. Indians are the best in other. 
what I say, talent, attitude, and teamwork. Unfortunately, the last is the worst in our case. <laughs> and supply chain is the most affected, I can tell you from Prithi. If out of 100 times, 99 times you have supplied the material in time, everything has gone well, no mention is made. But if one time you fail, then what happens? <laughs> why the production, why the manufacture is short, why the production stop? Part nahi aaya. Ye nahi hua hai, wo nahi hua hai. Now, as long as that kind of blame game continues, you know, you, yeah, you can have the best of the machine. So in other words, now we have to, you know, you may say, what can we do? We can do. And we can do is not to just be what is called all the time focused on urgent, urgent, urgent. We are all the time focused on urgent. Is it? Now there's something called important. Urgency, yes. Whether you like it or not, urgency will dictate and they will, it will take your time. But if you don't set aside time for important things, important things include learning about all the things, talent development, etc., etc., own development. That, I call that our usual Pareto's Law 80-20 rule, you know. 20% of my time I must reserve for my self-development. Learning something new, learning something better, seeing what can I do for other 80% is available for chasing, pure chasing as you call, purchasing is called pure chasing. But if you want to do creative purchasing, now there's a whole new concept called reverse marketing. Reverse marketing. Now it's not very new, it has been there. What is reverse marketing? Reverse marketing is the reverse of marketing, but what does it mean? Now in the morning you heard that you know, supply chain is for, uh, from end to end, and uh, what does it mean? Then there's a supply chain which is inbound supply chain, which is the purchasing and all that. Then there is a internal supply chain, which includes operational, manufacturing, where to store, how much to store, and then there is an outbound supply chain. Outbound supply chain means reaching up to the customer. Now the entire end-to-end -end is impo important. But most of us, most of us here are again focused on inbound supply chain. And the internal supply chain goes under the manufacturing and the uh, outbound goes under the this thing. So therefore, when we say the whole thing is a supply chain, should the supply chain manager be the boss? Should the head, head should be supply chain? And you call by any name, but what is important is TAT, teamwork. Whether the manufacturing head is in charge or you are the in charge doesn't matter. But era of finger pointings have to be stopped. That has to go away. Then only, you know, when you have peace of mind, you can spare 20%, 80-20 rule, 20% 20 of your time to do positive things. And what is reverse marketing that I was saying? Marketing is on the customer side of the supply chain. Reverse marketing is on the purchasing side of the supply chain. In this side we do market research. On this side we have to do supply market research. Purchase market research. When somebody says, how can we negotiate? So we negotiate because we issue a tender quotation, we have three quotations, whatever, and we negotiate. But if you do supply market research, you probably may have 10 suppliers, 20 suppliers, or whatever it is. Then this side we have customer satisfaction. Now that people are doing, and actually in India itself, softwares are available to evaluate vendor satisfaction. A satisfied vendor will always perform better for you. And satisfaction, we are not talking about, you know, patting him on the back or something like that, making sure. Uh, so vendor rating we do, 
you also do buyer rating. So reverse marketing means exactly the other side, other side of the coin. And if you take care of the customer side so well, what about the supplier side? So that is something that we really need to then the question had come in the morning, <clears throat> forecasting. There's a very famous quotation, forecasting will always go wrong. Forecast will always go wrong. And you know that, at least in Bombay, we know the weather is very erratic. The day the weather, for, weather forecast is that it will rain very heavily, everybody takes the umbrellas and just then nothing happens. <laughs> Not even a drop come. And the day they say it's sunny and dry, nothing, nothing, that day you find, you know. The, so, but which means what? We should abolish meteorological department? No. The answer is we must sophisticate, we must improve, we must modify our forecasting techniques. And Indian, Institute, Indian Statistical Institute in Calcutta has a three-year, four-year course in forecasting technique. So really, so what is really required is not to give up forecasting or have forecasting. Chalo Jyotsi ke paas ja ke puchha saab, bataiye mere ko kya hone wala hai mere ko. Hamari forecasting aise hoti hai. The maximum ads you see in the newspaper are Jyotishi walas. Wo forecasting nahi chalega. Supply chain forecasting is the forecast, the actual forecasting. You got to learn. And there is something, there's a concept called running forecast error, RFE. As you forecast and as some errors will crop up, you apply that adjustment factors. And over a period of time, your forecast will become more and more and more accurate. And do that for vital item, do that for A class item, not for every nut and bolt that you need to do that. So that is something, so forecasting will go wrong, yet we must do that. The last point, which I earlier I mentioned, is the urgent versus important. Urgent versus important. What do you think is important for supply chain? Important. Urgent is that yes, the chaser, that uh, user is chasing and you know, therefore 80% of my time, I, what is important? Information. Pardon? Information. Nee, I couldn't see some of it. Information. Information, yeah, okay, good. What else? Yeah, right. You cannot have poor customer service and a good product. Right. So all three, three things should be in the end of Yeah. Okay. So whatever, now you see, uh, you, what is important for you may be different from what is important from him, etc., etc. So in, in short, what is that we got to make our priority? When you talk about KRAs, you will find key result areas are again always to make sure so much of cost cutting, to make sure supply lead time is reduced, etc., etc. But there are, these are all urgent things, you know. What, what is a routine, day-to-day -day functions are urgent things. And they must not consume a hundred percent, they must consume not more than eighty percent. Twenty percent is what introduce what I just now said some of the modern supply chain concepts. Introduce uh, vendor satisfaction model. Introduce supply market research model, etc. Et Reverse marketing, etc. Et so if you say if you work 40 hours in a week, 20% of that means eight hours. Eight hours you set aside. That eight hours are meant to think and do something, create something, which is useful and important in you know. that timetable. You know. And let me tell you, thinking is very, very hard. It is much harder than doing. 
It's very easy to purchase or push, push purchase orders, chase suppliers, make calls and all that. But to think, how can I cut lead time of a particular material? Now that brings me to another concept called, please do LTA and LTC. Not again, leave travel assistance. <laughs> lead time analysis. From end to end when you say, if the lead time is six weeks, please do lead time analysis in hours, not days. How many hours are spent for what activity? And what can we do to reduce that? So lead time analysis, and then you do LTC means lead time compression. What can I do to compress the lead time? Now, if you can compress your supply lead time from four weeks to three weeks, your inventory goes down from four weeks to three weeks because always we keep inventory depending on whatever is the lead time plus a little bit extra safety stock. You know. So when you cut lead time or when you compress lead times, the inventories are bound to come. And inventories are bound to come mean that you will need less of Bank of Baroda supply chain finance. I'm not just <laughs> undoing their presentation, but I'm saying is that if all the inventory that you are keeping, you are paid for that, borrowed or your money or whatever. So lead time compression is a very valuable tool for managing your supply chain. Okay, so I think the tea is now ready and let's have it 15 minutes. Now I have great pleasure to welcome you at the final session uh, by Mr. Vivek Srivastava. He is a partner technology consulting practice of Deloitte, the famous consultants. Highly qualified Bachelor of Engineering Computer Science a Pune Institute of Computer Technology and Master's Degree in Computer Science from BITS. He is a partner based out of Pune at Deloitte and he has 22 plus years of experience in consulting global clients and enabling business benefits by monetizing data by helping organizations develop deep insights about products, customers and the market they serve. Leveraging digital and analytical techniques like IoT, Internet of Things, Data Science, and Big Data, he has built solutions for his clients which have helped them to progress on their digital journey. He has also very keen interest in brand building and talent nurturing. He is a dynamic leader who has tremendous multitasking and deep dive capabilities. His key competencies include several areas like solution architecture, business intelligence, data warehousing, analytics, and also he has experience in pre-sales, business analysis, requirement analysis, software project management, and global delivery. No, he has done so many things that I am just trying to be brief. He has managed complex BI data warehouse programs in Australia for large telco and insurance clients. He is also part of business analytics and optimization leadership team that build the practice of insurance and industrial sector. Immense experience in enterprise data warehouse projects and delivered many BI projects end to end. He has built strategic partnership even in very complex scenarios which helped his team during time of building offshore team. He has, and I speak from personal experience, tremendous communication, relationship building, leadership, strategic planning, and people management skills. Over to Vivek Ji. Please welcome him in visit.
thank you ashok ji um, and good afternoon everyone um, it's an immense pleasure to be here um, so near to the world famous iim ahmedabad and to be in midst of all of you um, and uh, what i would like to do is that uh, most of the times when i've run this session i've gone generally very slow uh, because each slide has a story behind it and um, we are we are almost at the end of the day i'm sure you all have learned quite a lot and there's not much new things i can say coming in the last is its own challenges you can imagine right there'll be nothing new that i'm going to tell you here that you might have not heard or you might have not googled or you might have not studied in your courses that you've taken what i'd like to do is really share you my experiences um i think experiences are unique uh, they are different and that's what helps it come alive so one of the things we can do is we have about i'll try to spare about 45 minutes uh, in about 11 to 15 slides um i'll insert couple of videos in between so uh, bear with me when i switch between the ppt and the uh, youtube uh, just to bring these things alive rather than it being a sort of a monotonous and it sermon like kind of setting almost um what will be really helpful is that if you stop me at times and and share your experiences um whether academic or industry i'm sure all of you have tons of experience and you would have massive amount of inputs that i can learn from you also so my simple request a humble request is within the 45 minutes that we have let's make it as interactive as possible um only when we share then we'll probably gain the best out of it so let's start um let me use the i'll cover three very simple topics what happens when we treat the entire end to end supply chain in silos how do you break those silos essentially how do you create a network now there are various ways to break a traditional silo i mean and obviously you all are far more better experts in supply chain than i am i am more of someone who has kind of studied data very carefully what has happened after or when the business is running all the kinds of data those you know signals that get generated across the network and how to make sense out of it and how to advise clients and how to advise my um, my um, my um, clients on how to monetize and use that so you know we have seen silos and we we almost all the companies i work for and i work for some very very large companies in the world and they are all working in silos so one solace we can take is even in india for last 7 8 years that i have been consulting before that most of the time i was consulting global uh, i found that you're not really doing that bad because we have these silos and we are trying to figure out how to break these silos so one of the concepts i will sort of give my take on it is how do you create a network because one of the ways to break silos is to create a network which um, which makes sense to all the stakeholders in the in the equation so we'll talk a little bit about that um i just want to give you a little bit in the introduction that digital and the way digital is getting adopted across the industry is giving a certain unique flavor to this network creation within supply chain so you are used to what's called typical supply chain network but we'll talk a little bit about what challenges it poses and how digital can help you solve it and finally um because i'm from data analytics background there's a little bit of section on my expertise just two three slides talking about how world class companies are looking at their digital networks and how they are solving problems using data analytics a simple a very 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 simple uh, example of how that has come to life for us on our mobile phones almost all of you would have used uber and ola right the ability for them what is it it's just a supply chain network you have a need which is a customer need of mobility to travel from point a to point b which is a universal need there are suppliers which are basically cab companies and we typically look at only that end of supply of giving you cab at the right time when the need exists there is whole subsequent downward industry i mean ola is going to do leasing financing help you buy a car if you want to start that business there is a downward supply chain after that entire car coming at your doorstep right and then there is obviously the upward they keep monitoring you 
I used to be in, uh, based in Mumbai for a long time and they actually started sending me emails at Diwali or some anniversary saying you have to travel so many miles or so many kilometers in the year. So what I'm trying to say is they've created and um, eventually it's a simple supply chain solution. Point I'm trying to make is the reason it's so effective and the reason it is so, you, how many times you've not really got an Ola and an Uber when you're at least in the in the zones where they service. Very little, right? So there is something happening behind that they are observing people's usage, where these people are, people are picking up, the kinds of car people are picking up. There's a whole lot of analytics and data going on behind those simple looking mobility solutions that you use on the phone. And that's the power of analytics that in very simple words I can explain, but I'll cover some more ideas around it, right? All right, so why do these silos get created? First of all, the whole reason is that there are some questions when you are in, a, in running a business. There are important business questions that you're trying to answer. So the whole thing starts from the entire corporate vision or a company planning exercise, which is generally three years to five years kind of a thing. Crystal, uh, crystal grazing into the future saying, this is where my organization stands and this is where we want to go. It might be benchmarked against the competition that you have. So you ask a lot of questions when you do strategic planning. And typically this is generally, you know, AOP planning that you start doing towards the third quarter of every year. And it becomes simply a tick mark exercise. Jo hai usko 30% se multiply kar do and let's go for it. I mean, most complex, this I've seen there. But in to be to, to justify it, this is what you're trying to do. You're trying to really answer some key questions. What is the, how do I cost quality and service efficient strategic planning? How do I visit, uh, how do I achieve company's vision? You know, your company will have a well set goals. And how do I delay? So then, you know, when you go to the next level, if you are a supply chain professional, you're going to ask some very pertinent specific question. Last year, my delay in my logistics is, was this was what the KPI I was tracking. How can I improve it and reduce the delay by X percentage? Helping the company save some money or whatever that business metrics may be. Obviously, then you have other things like manufacturing. Again, they have different set of questions they're trying to ask of because their KPIs and their KRAs are fairly different. Their KPI is to run the plant with the maximum efficiency to the best. So basically, they're working the asset. Their goals are to make sure that the assets that have been put in place, whether it is people asset or their machinery asset, it should be run to the optimum. So they have a different challenge when they talk about supply chain in their world. Their, their shop floors will not be running to the level they want if they don't have the raw material. They may produce certain things that are not really required by demand. So again, they, the things won't shift out of their premises, creating another kind of challenge. So they're answering different set of questions. Then you have demand planning, similarly again, People out in the market, out in the field, doing their whatever they are doing from their experience or trends, they are doing demand planning. Again, answering different sets of questions. Same way, warehousing, and I can go on and all supply planning, and order fulfillment, procurement, and transportation. Right? I ran through the slide a bit fast. These are simple questions. Any particular topic you take, you know, generally if you converse is with a business leader they'll be generally saying, I want to get an answer to these KPIs or these, uh, these questions. The thing is that there is, there is a common central thing, which is customer feedback. So most of the time, either you're in services business or you're in um, you know, product business, the whole reason you are in business is because, of, because you have a customer, there is a demand out there, right? So one of the ways uh, I have kind of over time realized and I have used it in my personal projects a lot is how do you break these silos? I mean, it's very difficult. You know, everyone has things they are very important and they are for all valid reasons. They are. But one of the best ways to break these silos is to put customer in between. And not just customer because customer can be a very, very vague concept. We have an entire practice talking about what customer needs, how do they want it, all of that. But it's important to hear feedback. If you really, really are in a, in, a, in a traditional industry which is growing, 
I'll give you a simple example. I was moderating a session in Economic Times a couple of years back, and there was this one um, very, very, uh, one of the C uh, group CIOs of a very large company. They were not look, and they were into this, uh, um, into this five fabric manufacturing. And they, they had a retail front end also to it. So they started sub thinking supply chain into, in that sense that what is the latest trend in shirts, which color shirts are men wearing, start from that point, listening to the customer feedback, making sure that the type of end product that you're delivering to your client, and then planning your entire supply chain in terms of producing the fi fabric, producing the fiber, all of that downwards from that point, using a very intelligent supply chain network planning. Right? So with that example, all I'm trying to say is that one of the very good ways of breaking these silos is to start putting the customer and specifically the feedback they are giving in the center. And this is, you know, this is very pertinent to Ola and Uber example. The reason they take your rating at the end of it, both from the driver as well as from what ha how you liked it, and they take a lot of those things, is because they are very, very mindful of customer feedback. I mean, and they are very prompt and proactive in how they manage. So if you just take any of the latest digital business, Airbnb, take any of your digital successful business, they are very, very close to making sure that everything is centered around customer feedback. Right? So supply chain are, is a very traditional and a very sophisticated um, subject which has evolved over years. Since the time goods have been moving in, in humankind history, supply chain and network exist. Right? But the way you could truly bake your silos is if you start putting the customer feedback in the center of it, right? So again, if you start linking all the siloed questions to the questions you would like to ask from a customer perspective, that's when you break the silo. So you keep in mind what questions you would you, your customers be asking with every department in this box, then you break the silo. Okay. So that's the concept I want to leave you behind with. Now, we are very used to the conventional way of running a supply chain. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm, no, I, I'm not an expert on this, right? What really happens is you develop the strategy, you plan based on that strategy, then you source or make a buy and a make decision. Whatever you source, you may source raw material, you may decide to make something and deliver and support. This is a traditional, linear, conventional supply chain network. Right? Been working for ages, it will continue working for ages, and there's no question asked that this is not going to suddenly start changing. Right? But the important thing, if you want to become the next um, Ubers of the world or Airbnb, is how are you leveraging this information? Because each one of these steps are generating thousands of bytes of information while it gets done. And most companies which have been able to disrupt or innovate on a particular sector are the people who have used information and data and analytics in a, in a very, very phenomenal way, right? So information really does not depend on those silos. It is an organizational asset. If tomorrow a company wants to transform their supply chain network, they should simply find a way to centralize and make sure they manage everything each department is doing into a central data lake or whatever you want to call it and federate that information that's available across the organization. That's the way to break the silo. Right? Because linearly you're creating information across. Now again, you think about another world, which was I was saying, and you start peeling the onion and you go to the next level, you'll start seeing that the, when you start coming to an inside-based decision making, how many cabs should I be sending to this zip code at this time of the hour? That's a very, very powerful emotion. If you don't have supply of cabs at the right time, you're going to lose that business. Right? That comes from insightful decision that you can do, right? So you break, you take all of the information that is getting generated and you integrate it, and you make sure that that decision-making process is open and available to all, right? So I want to show you a video before I move on to my next topic of supply chain network, so just bear with me for a second. What I really want to show you is an art of possible. It's a Googleable, I mean, it's a YouTube. You can just search it on YouTube. You can see it after, after I show you also. It's a Deloitte video available on net. But I want you to see that before we talk about the next topic. And I'll pause a little bit to get your feedback on what you think uh, is your experience on all of these things. So this is a video if you search by Deloitte. 
digital supply chain, you will find it there. I'm not sure about the voice. I hope can we have it? It has a pause in the beginning anyway. Son's basketball team. She's the head of supply chain planning. Earth has entered into an age of exponential change through digitization and connectivity. What was once a linear supply chain path is collapsing into a set of always-on dynamic integrated networks characterized by a continuous flow of information and analytics. Meet Janice, and she's not coaching her son's basketball team. She's the head of supply chain planning at a Fortune 1000 company. She's responsible for predicting how resources are used across an ever-growing number of interconnected internal and external teams. Janice's boss, Stephanie, has just let her know the full integrated supply chain plan needs to be reworked with a 10% lift for a presentation tomorrow morning. But when the entire production system is made visible, including vendor supply networks, predictive algorithms can take over with amazing accuracy and speed. And the report was run against hundreds of algorithms and a nearly infinite number of variables, producing real-time insights, not just an educated guess. Through the use of cognitive and concurrent planning, Janice can forecast, plan, and instantly react to changes across an interconnected supply network. Meet Sam, a procurement director for a large multinational corporation. Sam's company works with over 20,000 unique vendors who each deliver invoices differently. When he needs to know how fuel costs affect the bottom line, he turns to a self-learning system that scrapes dirty data from bill of materials, purchase orders, and invoices to recognize similarities. This is Walter. He's responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of a factory. Instead of reacting to day-old reports, he watches in real time as customer usage data pours in via connected sensors embedded into their products in the field. Algorithms running on this consumption data predict when specific customers will reorder, making inaccurate demand forecasts a thing of the past. This data is also shared with suppliers who always see the latest production schedules and engineering changes. The system automatically matches consumption patterns with material availability, releasing jobs to the assembly stations in a highly flexible way. As engineers make adjustments to the component specifications, the new work instructions are automatically updated and the end product is ready for shipment. What once lived in functional silos is now an integrated set of connected networks. A new digital revolution is upon us, one that marries supply chain and operational practices with digital technologies. Are you ready to answer the questions of tomorrow, today? So, <clears throat> let me get back to the agenda. So what we saw in the video is the art of possible. This is what is happening and there were a lot of technologies at play in that three minutes video. It's a very, very complex integrated solution that's working. And before I introduce to you um, the entire concept of how digital is breaking these silos and how they are kind of, so first of all the possibilities, right? We, we saw many of that in the live scenario, what you can actually do you can optimize the entire design process, right? I mean, we are not living in a world of mass selling. Everyone wants customized product. For example, even in the Ola and Uber example, I, because I'm an executive, I travel in a this, my needs are very different than my daughter's who's going to a college and I have given her a budget of 5,000 bucks to manage all her expenses. So she will always take and say, Ola, whatever, mini or something, and when I'm traveling, I'll, so, it is, it, we are living in a customized world. We are not living in a world where everything has to be just mass solution, right? So the first part is your entire design of your solution has got to be very optimized. It has to be very customizable, right? 
then you have product optimizing. Once you've designed it, then you want efficiencies of the scale to work for you when you translate that into product. The entire planning and the inventory management, you want it to be world class, right? Then you have risk and prevention and manage. This is a very, very big area that affect all of us, right? For example, your earlier speaker, they talked about their very elaborate um, supply chain network. In their case, their, their, their delivery patterns, both in the incoming raw material of crude and outgoing raw material of all kinds of de chemical products, is across the world. And you cannot predict and you don't, you have so many risk scenarios coming in that when you plan your entire network. Same way, supplier collaboration. Um, Ashok ji, when he was summarizing the session, he talked very, very much about this, that you, know, you don't just need to worry so much just about your customer. You need to make sure that you are also a very good buyer. You're making sure your suppliers have a very, very good experience when they supply things to you. That's when they're going to perform very, very well, right? When you have operational efficiency, this is absolutely in the time when you're customizing. You know, there was a world where everyone one was buying a certain kinds of things and there was very little customization. If you go to the Indian market 30, 40 years back, there was two or three options in car. You would either buy an ambassador or a Padmini 118 any or if you're somewhere on the upper segment, you'll buy Maruti 800. Now today you see the plethora of choices we have in terms of cars, the models and Variants and all of that, right? This is just 30 years, right? So again, you're looking at, you want to bring in the efficiencies of scale. You cannot, you know, you cannot have a planned build for one type of vehicle. The other day I was in a, in a factory in Ranjangaon who, who have a, who have an entire plant building and they can build all kinds of vehicle there. They can actually customize their line to start building engines if the vehicles are lesser in demand. So think about the way they have, so they, then it needs the entire different kind of inventory management, logistics management, because every six months they can actually theoretically change the entire thing. They can actually just start manufacturing completely a completely different product altogether, right? So this is the customize, this is the, these are the challenges at the back end when you talk about this kind of a world, VUCA world, where you are having everything volatile. Logistics. There's a, if you just open any balance sheet or any PNL of a company, you'll see two of the biggest cost is on people cost and the second one is logistics. Go to any company, any of the large companies, these are the two areas where they're spending most amount of money. Anywhere you can give upliftment, give them better tra tra trace and track solutions, you can give more efficiency in the way they're distributing their solutions, both incoming and outb outbound logistics. It's a huge, huge area of interest for them. Sales optimization, again, you know, you're not looking at a world where you want to deploy same traditional sales methodology all across, whether it is a services world today or it is this, the product world. Renault came out with the entire quid just on a digital platform, right? Today, there are car manufacturers are thinking if I have so many models and I have real estate is my biggest challenge, how do I kind of go to a South Bombay or a very expensive real estate and showcase all my models? in that one little area. So they're turning to digital. They'll keep one or two models there. You go, you wear the AR, VR um, solution, and then you can actually walk into the car almost as is. We've done a project actually for one of the, one of the luxury pro car, car makers in India about that. So their Chandigarh showroom has this f facility where you just walk in and you pick the model you want to see because they can't show you. You can actually visit, uh, you can experience it digitally, right? So this is entire sales optimization. It's a part of sales optimization. Huge cost we spend if you have fixed amount of sales cost coming in all the time. After sales and services, this is another big area. After you've sold it, there's an entire network of servicing that you, you do, right? So you, you need, so these are the art of possibles. And I, we saw what the future or what, it's not even future, what today holds for a well-organized digital supply chain network. What is the, what, what is the art of possible, right? So <coughs> we talked about this a lot, right? So there are technologies that are already helping us in little areas within that. And these are niche technologies. So when you talk about 3D printing in a traditional manufacturing environment, they are bringing down this. This plant that I talked about, their ability to customize their shop floor to a new product or a new solution or to a new line of delivery is just because of 3D printing. They are, they demonstrated to me that they are able to simply do 3D, uh, uh, 3D uh, using 3D technology, they were able to change the entire line, simulate everything, see all the bottlenecks in that before they physically actually build that line up. That's the only way they are able to shift their, uh, their ability to uh, reinvent their this, right? 
quality sensing, right? I mean, you don't want to find all the way in the end after you've kind of delivered the product and you're getting warranty defects that there were challenges in the quality and that go back to a raw material and then that go back, goes back to a certain supplier. I know of the clients in India who are exploring using blockchain to find out how do I, within my company when it enters, I can tag it. What happens to the parts before it enters my, my shop floor or before it enters my factory premise? How do I, then I use simple, easier to use technology because they're all supplying to me. I give them blockchain IDs and then I bring them on that platform where they can tag the sub assemblies of their parts that they're delivering to me as whole so that I can track if there is a defect in my, pro in, in my finished product. It has to go and do the root cause analysis beyond my factories. How do I do it, right? Because otherwise bringing them into expensive technologies, bring them onto your ERP, your, it's just too cost prohibitive, right? Similarly, cognitive planning. All of these areas are being explored. They are being used in a big manner all across the world, right? But what we are talking about here is these are incremental improvements in your traditional supply chain network. If you really, really want to use the power of digital to the maximum, you are going to shift towards the right-hand side of it, which is create your entire supply chain network based on digital, right? Where again, you create something we call digital core, which is nothing but a platform where everything that comes from a data and analytics perspective is centralized. And all those little sound bites and sensor data that I was talking about earlier, those silos we're generating are all sitting there in a common pool. And from there you connect the network. So suddenly the planning, which was just planning, you want to not just do, these adjectives are very important in that world. Your KPI or KRA is not just to plan. Your KPI and KRA is make your plan so dynamic that it is always synchronized to the challenges of the downstream or upstream, right? So you should be very actively able to plan almost on a run, uh, on a production schedule basis, your entire AOP, if something happens to your production. I have a query. Yeah. Many times like we give a planning, we give a plan to the customer based on everything goes on fine. Like there won't be any quality issues with things. That side or this side? This thing is more strange when you are dealing with a natural product. Yeah. Like if you are into a jute industry, when you are into water industry, when you are into plastic industry, it is not natural. It is basically right. manufactured. But when you are dependent on timber, wood, dust, and dust, there we face a lot of disruption due to the quality issue. Correct. Because the production is dependent on the nature. Yeah. Yeah. When you are dealing with the mother nature. So how this kind of an arrangement can help us to yeah. So, the simple answer to your question is how do you use predictive analytics to help you with that? Eventually, it is all about treating your data, getting a lot of similar scenarios into your, your planning and simulation system and then predicting for, to the best case possibility, right? So, it's just exactly like that. So, in your that example that you gave, you would obviously have some data for your own based on the raw material type where we have faced these kind of problems. You'll have your own set of data to analyze and predict what may go wrong in the next slot that I put into the manufacturing, right? The bigger play or better uh, analytics for that is what you can get from outside in a publicly available domain today. You can practically get almost all of these things as to what is the quality of crops and what is the quality of raw material that you're getting generated. And you can bring that insight and data in and use in your platform. That is why this digital core, I'm not probably, this is, it's a very big topic, I don't want to pick it up today, but when you call, talk about digital core and when we think about these kind of solutions, not just the data within your four corners of your, uh, your work environment is, is at play here. This digital core and with the big data technologies and all of that has ability to take, to take pretty much everything available on internet. That's of use to you. So you can do tagging, you can do text mining, you can do word clouding, you can bring all of that in and use it for that decision making and set it free again. And that's the way you have to build and think about the system. So the digital core has to be, you know, fungible. And now the technologies that are available today, cloud and others, enable you to create a digital core which is very fungible. fungible. You're not building a solution which is for us, it's a customized world. So your solution has got to be able to scale up, scale down the way you want it.
So not a perfect answer to question, but that's where it generally goes, right? So again, <coughs> to continue on, there are these adjectives that I want you to pay attention to. You are just not talking about customer. When you, how do you get feedback? If you're going to take the order and then deliver it after eight months and then next, that's the time you're going to talk about, talk to the customer, you're not living in the real world, right? You see the amount of tracking uh, today's um, digital companies do on you. I mean, if I go to Urban Ladder once, they keep sending me mails. We are missing you, come back, come back, come back. I mean, I'm just an example, but that's the way. They're always trying to be connected to you, whether you buy or you don't buy. One of the traditional ways, okay, he's gone, so let's not forget, forget about him. But religiously, they'll remember that last Diwali, you actually looked up this particular lamp, and then next Diwali, they reminded me, oh, you looked this up last year. Are you buying it this year? Right? That's connected customer. They are just not leaving me. Right? That's an example of how. And you do the same thing. You start using Uber for, say, I mean, earlier I used to do this thing, right? I mean, I used to use half time them, half time this. And they recognize that pattern. Suddenly I stopped using Ola altogether. They started sending me very customized offers saying, you travel from Bombay to Pune regularly, we'll give you 1399, whatever, you know. That's the power of being connected to your customer because you're predicting his behavior, right? So similarly, you know, whether it's smart factory, so you don't want just a factory. You want factory which is able to give, you know, in that video you saw, they are constantly talking to their supplier with their current latest production schedule. So they are making their current production schedule available to their supplier so that they can plan their stuff far more better. So that's the way you are kind of looking at the future or I must say today of the digital supply chain network. Right? So I'll go a bit slow here. Um, I'm coming to my last section. I, I told you in the beginning itself, I'll go a bit slow because these are complex topics, very easy to put in it on a slide and I don't want you to just fly because the slides look very nice and the videos look very nice. These are very difficult solutions to implement and, but this is where the world is going. Every company is a technology company. It's a cliche, everyone must have heard it. Anywhere you'll go, if you don't have appreciation, basic knowledge uh, about these things, you cannot live, you're not living in a traditional world at all. Right? This is the future. So I'll come to my last section. Again, I'll start, you have a question? Okay, I have a, again a small video to show and then we'll come to this one. <clears throat> Supply chains exist to serve customer demand and... and Sorry. Analytics is fast emerging as the linchpin of the demand-driven supply chain, which sounds great, but what does it really mean? I'm so sorry. ...exist to serve customer demand, and analytics is fast emerging as the linchpin of the demand-driven supply chain, which sounds great, but what does it really mean in practice? Consider the case of a family moving into a new home. By the time they've moved in, They've made hundreds, if not thousands, of decisions about what to purchase. Granite or concrete countertops, nylon or polyester carpets, brass or stainless steel fixtures. You get the idea. A demand-driven supply chain anticipates what they'll choose, accounting for issues like customer preference, what they're willing to pay, how social media is influencing and reflecting their decisions, and more. That's where analytics tools that look at issues like social sentiment can play a big role. In a demand-driven supply chain, analytics-driven insights inform decisions at every step along the chain. To see what that means, let's work backwards through the supply chain. How did the product reach customers? Did it arrive on time? In a demand-driven supply chain, the customer needs to know when they can expect your product, and you need to plan on how to get it there on time. Analytics tools can help you meet your customer promise dates by looking deeper into transportation performance and helping better predict the unexpected. Before that, there's the making of the product, when you need to know how to better manage costs, meet the latest quality standards, and shorten lead times. Analytics and visualizations focusing on product complexity, plant productivity, production mix and allocation, and risk-adjusted lead time can offer a much clearer picture of key production issues like these. Even further back, there's sourcing, 
What's your risk exposure from global suppliers and how much risk is acceptable? What's the environmental impact of your sourcing? Analytics tools can help clearly show what's really being sourced and procured, what's happening throughout the value chain, what the specific impacts of decisions are on costs, and where potential supply crises are emerging around the world. And at the very beginning, there are all the considerations that go into planning and development. When you need to know who your top customers are and how to segment them, customer sentiment, the potential market demand, product design insights, desirable features, and a lot more. Analytics can help with all of the above. Analytics-generated insights are the way to make a smarter, customer-centric, demand-driven supply chain, one that's connected at every step. Serve your customers better. Become smarter and more efficient behind the scenes. Deloitte's focused analytics solutions can help you with your toughest supply chain challenges today. Let's talk. Sorry, I don't want to make this a Deloitte sales pitch or anything. Just we leave it to the academic level where we are today. So, some of the questions you asked, if you heard carefully, that's there. So, they talked about sourcing and they covered a wide array of sourcing uh, in that, right? Which would, which would be traditional sourcing which are make, traditional sourcing which have raw material and all those kind of things that you could kind of factor in both the impact of that on quality, cost, timeliness, all of those things, right? So, we saw a video which is, you know, very easy to kind of comprehend, one simple dashboards coming out and telling you what's happening wherever. All kinds of te technologies, AI, ML, everything is at play behind those decks. And what I want to do in this last section of another 5-7 minutes is that I'll tell you how this comes to life, just in a very simple manner. How would you go about thinking about this, right? So what we tra traditionally what the industry calls as that control tower because eventually we talked about the core if you remember a couple of slides back and then before that we talked about breaking the silos with the customer feedback. So again it's a network you're creating with something in the center so something has got to be controlled. So that's the way you start thinking about the control tower right and that's where you kind of have all kinds of these variables if you remember my previous slide of adjectives. How do you make it happen? How do you do connected customer? How do you make a factory smart? How do you do all of those things, right? Is by creating a tower which kinds of helps you com control the entire thing, right from the sourcing, the way that video explained you, to the final customer. And then you, you know, basically you have, you have well-defined areas that are elements that are required to go into those making of those towers, right? These are all very complex things in themselves. And we have been doing it traditionally. So nothing, and I told you, is a, I made a comment saying the traditional network is not going anywhere. It's just getting reorganized. So all the efficiencies and all the knowledge that those individual towers, logistics, all of those boxes had in my first slides just become connected seamlessly. And all of those KPIs and KRAs and elements have a big role to play in each one of this, just in a connected manner. right? What I would like to then now spend a couple of sec slides is that what are these technologies that are helping you do? And you, have, you would have heard about all these things. I said in the beginning, I'm coming last, there's nothing I'm going to tell you is new, right? All of these technologies you have heard of, you have seen some of the outcomes of what they can do for you. So robotics and cognitive algorithm, right? Anything that is predictable and that's been happening and you can take any process, any process within those silos. There is a lot of intelligence that is built in the repeatability of the same process, the deviation path that those processes take, and you can automate all of that using RPA technologies today. You can take all the data those things are generating and you can go one step further and make it cognitive. You can make sure that analytics runs on top of it to start predicting and giving you right directions. Which pool should you move this particular thing to, right? All those things come to play, right? So there are examples like process automation configuration, GUI automation, advanced decision systems, all of them are aided by RPA and RCA technologies today. There are cognitive language technologies that are at play. You know, the entire, again, coming back to our favorite Uber and Ola example, they use this in a big way. Google uses this in a very, very big way, right? They've suddenly broken down the entire language barrier because they are able to service all the customers with all the linguistic, linguistic needs at a very cheap price. The reach of whatever they are able to do is because of that they broke the language barrier. 
right? So it's not something just available to English speaking people suddenly, it is available to everyone, right? Similarly, you have AI and ML, machine learning. Again, I mean, I have had use cases that have kind of helped customer form on the entire health and safety and training needs. Because there's a big cost to making sure that people can understand how they are supposed to operate an asset. And there's an entire application of how you can make it self-learning, how you can help people with a completely different way of doing it rather than bringing them to a class and, you know, training them. Whatever technologies I talk about giving an experience of to a customer of multiple car models can be done the same thing for our employees, right? So, I mean, in the previous session talked about how talent is such an important area and this is a very big area where people are leveraging technology in a very, very big manner, right? Then we have computer vision. So all of this image recognition, video analytics, handwriting recognition, much of, I mean, we are a traditional, if you typically go back to some of the traditional supply chain uh, network industry, not many of them are, say, 10 years old, like all these examples we keep giving. These are the companies which have been here for a long time and they have traditional supply chain networks and much of it is manual for all we can say right so you have you need all these technologies to suddenly break those barriers that have been existing for a long time this is my last slide um, the way we kind of uh, explain these things is that you go from left to right you basically start with the issues that you are trying to address and not all issues can be addressed at all the times and they may not be applicable to all the clients right then you obviously create a strategy because end of the day you're giving that entire insight to your business and then you apply innovative sciences any one of these technologies that I talked about and then you simply scale in an outcome driven operation so if you saw that control tower this is the how part of it if you want the end the end of that the control tower you would go about doing this and obviously never losing sight to that adjective voila slide that network because that's why you're doing all of this. What is the outcome that you're getting from all of this, right? So this is the way holistically we put together. Now, if you have any questions, I can pause. Otherwise, I'll wrap up with one last video that I wanted to show you, where it's not really a just supply chain video. It's the how, because when we keep talking supply chain, we're still talking about companies, I mean, our own world, within our four walls or with our suppliers or with our uh, entire that, right? I wanted to show you one case study, again a publicly available case study from YouTube, where all of this has been delivered for a client. So, any questions or should I move to that? Yep, please. First is mindset. Uh, um, Ashokji talked about people's mind being very set thinking this is a very complex thing. It is not. I mean, today kids are using all kinds of analytics on their phones. If it was that complex, it, so the biggest, I mean, I'll tell you from my experience, there are two big, uh, big roadblocks. One is a mindset, and the mindset is across. You'd be surprised how deep-rooted this mindset problem is. People pay lip service to it, but they are not ready to change, even at the highest level of organization. They are so used to getting that number on a phone, or someone giving them a chit, explaining them the number that they, so this is the mindset. The second is actual availability of real good data. That's the second big problem because there is data, but what is of use, I mean, by finding those nuggets or, or the golden things to use is a big problem because there's a lot of bad data. We are generating data, but we are generating more bad data than we are generating good data. So finding that one particular feedback that you got on a social network, which is worth taking an action on, is not an easy thing because there's so much of um, trash getting generated that you really have to dig, 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 dig to find that. So in my mind, from an adoption perspective, those are the two main things, the mindset and the... So can the top management play an important role in production? It's, there's no can in that. There's no can. They have to play. If they don't drive it, and again I'm saying I have seen people paying lip service, coming in the kickoff meeting and then finally not using the dashboard created for them. So again, I'm saying the mindset issues, we generally tend to think, oh, it's the employee on the, on the ground and they have to change. No, change management has got to be in the way you're running the business. Otherwise, how do you anticipate which, um, you know, uh, which company is going to just come across in a digital manner and kill your entire uh, revenue stream? What are you going to do then? 
the mindset change has got to happen from the top first and most of the successful adoption I have seen when the mindset change has happened first on the top and then they are asking others to follow. But many companies go the other way. Someone gives a vision, still keeps doing the same thing his, his, their own way, the way they are so comfortable, they have been very successful and they ask everyone at the rest of the organization to change. That's not the right way to do it. Yes, sir. <coughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'll just like to modify your question a bit before I answer. First of all, you cannot use analytics tool. Because the question asked, who are using analytics tool in a proper manner? Tool is a very, very, very small component of this whole story. That's why you see, even though I'm a technologist by all kinds of things, you can see how much technology did I talk about in this entire slide back. And I know all of you have good engineering background. The reason being, we engineers are very, very used to thinking and sol solving everything with technology. And this is not a technology challenge at all. Technology, there's abundant technology available for it to solve anything. I go to clients where they have all kinds of tools. And when you ask them, what is the business intelligence you are using, they say, we are not using this particular tool. So first, again, sorry to kind of, it's a mindset thing. People think that everything can be solved by putting a tool or technology. Someone actually mentioned earlier also that technology is the easier thing. Ashok, Ashok ji mentioned that technology is the easiest thing to solve. The challenge that I have seen most of the time is the last slide. What is your core objective? What are you really trying to do? Because you cannot churn the ocean. It's a massive change to create a digital core. You have to prioritize which two or three things, creating the right business case, aligning the right, so that you know that I link it back to the story that Dr. Shibani was explaining. What is the purpose? Why are you doing all this? Right? So that's where most of the time people miss. Now I'll give you some examples because you asked in process industry, EPC industry. These are traditional industries. Okay, these are not industries that have been yet disrupted by, you know, it's easy to talk mobility. Mobility, fine, you know, somebody is just, it's a, still a B2C industry. The industry that you're talking about are clearly B2B industries, okay? But the interesting take that one has to look in it, eventually nothing is B2B, right? Everything is B2B to B2B to somewhere it C comes. So the challenge really happens is how do you start seeing C? And in these industries that the examples that you took, traditional manufacturing, whether it is discrete or process, it is EPC industries, is clients have started looking at that aspect of it. Am I simply building an aluminum sheet? Or am I building an aluminum sheet which is going to sit in an Aston Martin uh, car getting built in Italy? So it's two different things. Is it going to make a small vessel, aluminum vessel on which you're going to make your tea? or this thing is going to go there and sit into a high speed rope car which runs at zero. So, so when you start going to that direction and people have started, that there is very slow progress but people have started because one of the biggest problems in our traditional industries is that it is a very, very complex to solve linking demand driven supply, sub, supply chain, right? It, that is a very simple thing to say but for a traditional Im industry, there are so many variables at play. I mean, I worked for a very large EPC client about one and a half years back. And their challenge was just the enormity of the things to consider. When someone is building, say, a road in Oman or a bridge in, in um, Telangana or, a, or a, you know, doing electrification of some things, in, it, is, it is a traditional industry with so many variables that that becomes the biggest channel. Because how do you start? And they miss out on your purpose. So if you collect the right purpose, you have this mindset thing addressed at the top and then you've put the organization force behind it, it works. Very few examples, again I was coming to that. See, most of the time it has fizzled out. In my, my personal experience, it starts with a good amount of fanfare, we analytics, we have big data, karna hai. without understanding, without defining the purpose, people jump into it, they spend months trying to think what's the right use case. They don't align, they don't select the right business. But there are companies who have learned that lesson. <coughs> they are going slow, but they are going the right way. So even if there are 20 things you could do, but the purpose is well defined, then they go around. 
So I can give you many examples. Some of them are obviously public and some of them are, but I can, in a one-to-one -one discussion, if you want, I can give you some very specific examples. Yeah? Sir, in this digital <coughs> network, this what is characteristic of intelligent supply? So if you saw the video, um, traditionally you will take, what do I need? I have to order. That's the way you look at. So if you are inside the, and you are ordering raw material and you are a purchaser or you are a manufacturer, you, are, you, are, you have a whole system built saying that I will decide which month mereko kya chahiye, what raw material I need, what finished good I need, whatever, what pr pr procured thing. Intelligent supplier will anticipate all this. So they will not take that responsibility just with themselves, they will keep all their production schedules open because the de demand is dynamic. Suddenly if I take that car example that I gave you, if the supplier of say a component, a turbocharger within an engine or within a particular manufacturing unit of that car, if that guy knew that next five months these are the models you are going to actually make, he can modify his production schedule according to yours. So the traditional ERP that you'll be running and saying, for that month, if I have to produce so many units of this particular product, if you expose that, and then the supplier is intelligent enough to adopt to that saying, suddenly this client is now going to make so many different kinds of model for which they are going to require these parts. And you can come proactively and say, look, I have seen your production schedule. This is what you require. I am ready with the supply. That is intelligent. And there was a, if you, if you watch the video carefully, that's why I said it's a publicly available video, watch it again and again. I have watched it many times, it takes me also time to get fully into how that works. There are elements of this in that. I mean, there are suppliers, they talk about how they expose their production schedule to all their suppliers and how suppliers then adopt to it. And technologies like blockchain and all, while primitive, are, will be able to break this because there is no financial transaction here. All you're telling them is, Mereko itne parts lagenge. So why do you need a full ERP, ledger, ledger, everything? Because there's no financials yet, right? So these technologies will very fast creep up and they will break these silos in a very big manner. Any other question? All right, I'll go to my last video and then I'll wrap up, hopefully right in time. In my current role, I'm in charge for Daimler Truck Seisha's quality management worldwide. Overall, our trucks are running in around 150 markets from our plant here in Japan, where we have the brand of Mitsubishi Fuso, as well uh, from our plant in India, where we have Barat Benz and the new Fuso brand. I'm the CIO of Daimler Trucks Asia and we are in the manufacturing business, so we are a very traditional industry. I need to be one of the disruptors in this company. I need to challenge the people to think about new business models and I need to tell them how they can achieve this with technology. The goal for us is basically to transform Daimler Trucks Asia into some kind of a data-driven organization to lead the commercial vehicle industry into the future. This whole program of proactive sensing was to bring Daimler Trucks Asia decision-making into the insight-driven decision-making world and be predictive so that Daimler Trucks Asia could respond proactively. These trucks are out on the road, thousands and thousands of them, and when they have quality defects, it all reflects back on the brand. We started with a proactive sensing to identify potential risk which can lead to a safety incident. We named it proactive sensing 
because we want to detect the failure before it occurs. Daimler Trucks Asia recognized early on that the current quality management process they had, all the way from identifying issues that they were getting from field reports, service records, etc., and the time to identify that issue, investigate it, and do the resolution was taking close to two years at times, and they wanted to speed that up. We met the Deloitte team and I was really impressed. I could feel really the fire was burning in them. There was a lot of data, but the data was sitting in pockets. The data was isolated from each other. The data was not in the best form from a usage standpoint. To go through that data and very quickly identify where issues could be and do it with an urgency is a challenge because these could lead to very serious safety issues. We were able to help them apply our techniques and scientific skills in identifying these issues faster using algorithms. I said, wow, this proves to me they are looking beyond. They exceeded my expectations. Currently, with our calculation models that we are having, with the quality alerts which are generated out of the proactive sensing, we are already 11 months faster to detect a quality issue. Roughly savings uh, of warranty costs per year, easily $8 million. And the next step to further improve proactive sensing is the connected trucks. With the connected trucks, we have real-time data. Sorry. And that's where we drove and evolved from going from just pure insights to smart insights. And that's why we are so happy with the outcome, but it's not the end. And also the collaboration with Deloitte is not at the end. Deloitte was basically bringing to the table the new sorry, view on topics, how we can make things. I don't want this. You can go and look at this video. It's not about Deloitte. It's about what that solution did for the client. And I just wanted to connect. Um, sorry, that video is a bit marketing and salesy video. But what really I wanted to give you a view is how it all comes together from a client perspective. right? So it just gave you a view as to everything that I talked about in the last 45, 50 minutes, how it is connected and given a solution to the client. So any parting thoughts, anyone else? All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you Vivek ji for your excellent presentation. Thanks a lot. He has last seven days, he has gone to Riyadh. He came back uh, just two days ago, then went to Bangalore. <laughs> and from Bangalore. Yeah, he went to Bangalore directly uh, from Riyadh. Riyadh. So, very hectic schedule, but he's still uh, uh, come here. Thank you very much. I wish you all the best. And maybe present to you a small token as an appreciation. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, you want five minutes standing break or you're okay? Okay, I'll just, I'll not take full 30 minutes, just few few minutes. And then we also have a certificate for each one of you at the end we would like to present to you. Now, <clears throat> this session as uh, you saw in the schedule is uh, merely not to sum up the whole day's proceeding, but just to add a few things. So, which this quotation is, has been there on our brochure itself. So what is important here is that not we do our engineering, we do our MBA, that's not enough. I mean, we've got to be learning constantly, continuous learning has to be done and relearning has to be done. Now, 
what is the talent pool of 21st century? Once again, I, I, as a uh, repetitive TAT or TAT, small TAT, tools and techniques, big TAT, talent and teamwork. So what uh, more and more people are saying is that tools and techniques, incidentally, this is a, this is a um, uh, sort of a, this is used by Toyota and I learned it when I visited Toyota Japan, let's see. And the, the story goes like this, that we went to see Toyota. And I was there, plus maybe 15, 20 other Indians were there. And there were people from auto factories or auto company, Indian companies also, they went there. So we went to Toyota and then the vice president came and briefed us a little bit. And then they took us for a round of the plant. And the plant is like a five-star hotel, carpets and everything, beautiful. And and after that visit, we were again brought to the room and the vice president stood here and he said, all right, now you have seen the thing, any questions and all that. So anyway, people ask technical questions, this, that, but I asked him one question. I said, uh, Mr. So-and-so, whatever was his name, that you know that in our group we have people from the automobile industries and you are telling everything what you do and you have taken us including the auto fellows around the plant so don't you think that you are sort of uh, sharing your trade secrets etc etc and this was the answer he gave and i remember till this date he says mr my name is a, what i have shared with you are our tools and techniques just in time you can find in the books the hundreds of papers published tools and techniques are wonderful so you can take them away but what you cannot take away is our talent attitude and teamwork which takes years to develop you know so that is what is you see when they say they are the pioneers who introduced git and so many other things he said, it cannot happen, and the attitude, the biggest, is, he, he said, the, the teamwork is the same. Most of the companies, most, especially in India, we work in silos. Silos means different, you know, different kind of barricaded departments and all that. And generally those departments are at loggers head you know very very rarely you find them you know working together especially in the time of crisis the fingers you know get pointed out so this is what is the meaning of this is that not not that we can overcome that overnight it will take time but the point is that we need to focus now when you say technology okay we heard all this a beautiful technology but as i say technology you can buy Technology is an enabler, but if we don't have talent, then the technology what uses the technology. So here, technology is to be used as an enabler, and it is not artificial intelligence versus human intelligence. Human intelligence will always remain superior. Artificial intelligence is going to be only a support to all of us. As recently, I came across this that first person is asking, are you concerned about the increase in artificial intelligence? And he says, no, but I'm concerned about the decrease in real intelligence. <laughs> artificial intelligence, though, is, I mean, we are already using computers in this, how many things we have replaced, a typewriter, this thing, this thing. There's nothing has happened. In fact, jobs have increased in computers. Similarly, artificial intelligence will help us to do our job better, but we have to have our intelligence. Now, we are talking about Industry 4, you know, these days. You know, Industry 1, what, what was Industry 1? Steam engine. And if you go to some museums where steam engines are there, you will also find a, a placard like this where the pundits of that time, pundits mean the, the leaders of the public figures, have said, whoever travels in this cart of fire shall have his life shortened by so many, so many years. 
that is, if you travel by steam engine, your life will become shorter. So that scare or the fear of technology, the fear of you know innovation has always been there and it will remain. And now today we think artificial intelligence will grab uh, the jobs and so forth. You know. Now this is the pa pa uh, Porter's um, value chain, very, I mean, long time ago. And if you look at it, interestingly, even 20 years ago he talked about purchasing as a value adding function throughout the company. So purchasing is not a department. Now instead of procurement, we are using the term supply chain, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, the rest of the things are, if you look at this picture, is procurement, inbound logistics, all outbound logistics, all, there are so many functions related to our, our area, that supply chain that we call today. Now, for the future, what are the skills required? Let's first look at the current nine skills. There are hundreds of skills we a purchaser needs. But we find things like this, negotiations, making decisions, interpersonal communication, ethics, common sense. These are the current, this is incidentally, the Institute of Supply Management US. This is their research, earlier called NAPM, National Association of Purchasing Management USA. They have said these are the current skills and what are the skills required for the future. So it's not my presentation, my, my <laughs> I'm in list, it is the uh, ISM list. Now, top nine future skills. And interestingly, top nine future skill, and I have coined that term for KYS. What KYC, you have heard all. KYC, know your customers. Now, say that is the marketing side. What do we have to do in reverse marketing? Know your suppliers. So not, so supplier is one only. Then you say know your suppliers, know your systems. Know your specifications. Know your specifications. I mean, just like they know, custom, they know their customers, we must know our materials, you know. If we don't know the key material that we buy and just do a clerical job of passing the, what comes from operations to, to the market, it won't happen. So we are knowing the materials. You know, so. Again, which, what we are talking, 10% of the materials which account for 70% of your purchase volume. Very selective kind of thing. So now here you see, again you'll find human skills, cross-cultural cross -cultural negotiation because we're in the era of global sourcing, global buying, etc., etc. Global and strategic sourcing, supply market research, which I have already said. KYS means know your suppliers. KYC is know your customers. KYS is know your supplier, their strengths, weaknesses, what's going on there, what can it, again, key supplier, the key supplier. There. Then they say we need to have knowledge of materials or services that we buy. Finance, costing, ethics, if you are working in a global environment, you know Rafale versus this and all. You know, different, different cultures have different, different ethical values. So uh, that is important. KYS, I already said, know your supplier. So that SRM has been there for a long time, supplier relationship management. Technology, whole day we have been talking about it, operations. And KYS means know your systems. Know your systems, whatever, artificial intelligence or whatever. Then you say leadership, leadership making decisions. Now here it is very important. It is said that the managers need two types of qualities. One is called know-how, which is all this, and the other is called show-how. Please don't mistake show-how for a negative. I'm not talking about you become a, a film star or something, show how. 
the what it means, know-how means the knowledge of the subject, knowledge of the supply, all that there. The show-how means the ability to present that to your top management, to your other party or whatever it is. You see, which are the departmental heads who get opportunity to spend time with the CEO of any company? Just ask yourself, who are the HODs, heads of departments, or which department they get maximum time with the CEO? Marketing, finance, yes. Marketing, finance, operations, manufacturing. Where does supply chain come? In terms of time in terms of the attention which the CEO gives to you. We get attention only when we fail, when we don't supply something immediately, lots of fingers are pointed and then we come into the limelight. You know, and you have called to the boss's room with a, that kind of. Now the question is how do you make that change? And that show how means ability to present to the CEO or whatever is your, you know, boss's boss, the quality things that you are doing. Quality thing means which are adding value. If you say, yeah, number of purchase order place 200, the number volume of purchase 300, three, three, three crores, that has no meaning. What is meaningful is, what kind of improvements have you done? What kind of cost reduction have you done? What kind of new vendor development system, etc.? So that, what is important, that is very, very important. So making decision and leadership. And other thing which is talk, talked about is knowledge of the materials. KYS also knows, know your specification. Now please think today, one sales girls join your organization. And supposing she, you are a mobile phone or whatever seller. Now before that sales girl is sent to the market, what is done? She is told that you are going to sell this, just go and sell it. Is it like that? No. You, they tell her, you tell her about this is what, how it works, this is what it does, this is what it does. So there will be at least a day or two or three training before she goes out. But you come as a purchase officer today and you get a requisition to buy this. What kind of training do you get? Now this may be a very extreme example, but what I'm trying to say is knowledge of procedures is one thing but knowledge of the product, key products at seat also very important. Otherwise we are administrative purchasers, administrative buyers, which is this season. Then of course the leadership, I said already, legal and national and international rules, regulation, customs and so forth. Then some focus areas, Green, green, now you all hear, hear green. Now the, it is said that the maximum scope of providing green inputs is through the purchasing department because 80% or 70% of the items come via purchase department. Some may come directly to manufacturing or something. So what is green? Can you buy that? Green purchasing is a new subject, now being taught for last five, 10 years in outside there. India, we don't still talk about green purchasing. The green labeled goods are there, green certified this thing. When you invite quotations, not only you ask for price, quality, delivery, etc., but you ask for carbon dioxide emissions units. And you will not decide based on price, quality, delivery, but also on what is the number of units that particular product emits carbon dioxide during its manufacture, during its usage, and during for its disposal. 
life, total life cycle, what is the effect on the green effect. That is, these are all the future areas that you see here, focus area. Then distribution management, GIT-3 is more automated deliveries and so forth, inventory control, MOQ is minimum order quantity, logistics, manufacturing, sales, service coordination. This is going to be the thing. Without this, uh, your supply chain cannot function. International buying, of course, vendor rating and satis vendor satisfaction. I earlier also said, you never heard of the term called vendor satisfaction. Uh, vendor satisfaction is important. Of course, which vendors? Yes, you got to select key supplier, just like we have key account management, this is now key supplier account management. Just like you don't run after every customer, you have key accounts. Similarly, key supplier accounts are there. Purchasing a procurement, of course, quality assurance, supply market knowledge. This I earlier also said SMR, supply market research. Now whether sitting in a cabin and just inviting quotations and Googling sources, that is, no, that is not supply market. Supply market research is actually speaking, you might have heard of this, something called ETIG, Economic Times Intelligence Group. There's something called TES, Strata Economic Services. For every electrical manufacturer association, motor car manufacturer association, so many associations are there. So if you become members of that and then be active on that, not just by attending meetings and seminars, but also trying to find out actually the, the sources of that. ETIG, for example, give you resource, economic time intelligence group. You can become a member online or you can become a member otherwise. You can get lots and lots of information about products that are happening. Now, for example, what are the supply chain practices in Indian, Indian industries? They have beautiful publication on that, you know. So that is what is really quality assurance, supply market knowledge, I've said strategic sourcing, legal and commercial acumen. Legal and commercial acumen, now you say, you must have read a few days ago, somebody said, now if a Tesla car is going and it stops to save the pedestrian crossing the road and in the process the man behind car behind comes and dashes and that man is killed, who is responsible? Tesla car or the person sitting in that or the owner of Tesla car? There are no laws <laughs> at the moment, you know. So anyway, those things will come, but we need to know about legal and commercial acumen, national and international. And of course, warehousing, automated, in India, we are still following very, very outdated, antiquated uh, practices. So ASRS, automated storage system, and so many other things, they're all manufactured in India, AGVs, automated guided vehicles, all available in India at a very reasonable cost. We need to work on that. So this is just a kind of a summary of all that what we have done it. So knowledge areas, supplier analysis, total cost analysis, competitive market analysis, supplier relationship management, commodity expertise, supply chain management. Now incidents in the morning somebody said supply chain management itself is becoming obsolete term. See, supply was important. Now the people say supply was important during scarcity days. When for getting a Bajaj scooter, they, they were manufacturing only one lakh scooters. And to get a scooter, we jokingly used to say you book a scooter in the name of your son on the day he is born. Because it will take about 18 years to get the scooter. Now, so that time, Supply was important because supply was in shortages. Today, supply is of no concern. What is the demand? Demand of this brand, that brand, or whatever product you are manufacturing. 
the demand assessment is far more important. And therefore, forecasting, what we discussed earlier, it is required. Forecasts will be wrong, but still you can't do without it. You have to do that. So that is the what we mentioned. So DCM will be, it has been replaced in some already textbooks by DNM, Demand Network Management. Supply Chain Management, then it becomes DCM, Demand Chain Management. Then you say demand chain management means it's not only one chain. In automobiles, tire is one chain, steering case is another ch the chain, carburetor is another chain. So th there's a chain of chains. And what is the chain of chain? Network. So probably a year from now or two years from now, uh, the name of our uh, profession will change. And some company in, in India today, they have a vice president DNM, no SCM. Demand network management. <clears throat> so with that, we come to the close of this uh, event. Now I have the pleasure to uh, request Mr. Ravi Tulsian to hand over the certificates. And Ms. Mr.